Let's talk GLP-1s, shall we? In perimenopause, when hormones are shifting, it's no surprise that GLP-1s are becoming a very popular tool for our demographic. And today I'm gonna to talk you through what a GLP-1 is, why it can be beneficial for some people, and most importantly, how you can boost your body's own production of GLP-1 starting today. How do I know this? I'm Christy, and not only am I a fellow perimenopausal woman, I am on the earlier end of perimenopause, but I am a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I help women navigate perimenopause so they don't feel like they have to white knuckle their way through it, and they can feel a little bit more like themselves again during this crazy life stage. GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptide 1. It's a mouthful. What it basically means is it's a hormone produced by your stomach when there are certain nutrients that are present. It's kind of like a tiny messenger that sends a lot of communication after you eat. It's released by your intestines and it talks to all sorts of other parts of your body, but some more specifically is your brain and your pancreas. It can help control blood sugar regulation, appetite, and digestion. It's one of your body's built-in appetite and metabolic regulators. It plays such a huge role in your satiety signals, how much a meal satisfies you, also helps to stabilize your blood sugar, and it helps you feel full in a balanced way. And because GLP-1 has so many wonderful benefits, pharmaceuticals have come along and come up with an option that mimics what our body naturally produces and amplifies it. And there's a lot of pros to these drugs. They help to suppress your appetite and reduce your food intake, which then in turn helps weight loss. Many people who go on these drugs are reporting a lot of weight loss, as I'm sure you've seen. They also help improve blood sugar control, which can have a cascade of other benefits across your body. When you have erratic blood sugar, so when your body is not able to utilize glucose well and your body is not super sensitive to insulin, that can cause a lot of other problems. Having excess glucose in the bloodstream is very inflammatory to the body. It can damage blood vessels. It can trigger inflammation. So its effects on blood sugar control is huge. And it has built-in appetite regulation. So you'll hear a lot of people reporting that they don't have as much food noise in their brain. So they're able to better listen to their body when they are actually full or hungry. Also, aside from the inflammatory benefits of decreasing a lot of the effects of erratic blood sugar issues, it also helps calm the immune system and tells it just to chill out, which by default helps inflammation. So tons of benefits, especially for somebody who has pretty severe metabolic dysfunction, GLP ones are a total game changer for them. I hate that term, but it's true. Have you been hearing about GLP ones everywhere or are you on one? Share your experience in the comments. I always love to hear where you guys are at. And I also want to say too, this is not a video on whether or not you should take it. This is not a substitute for medical advice. This is not a substitute for a conversation with your doctor. I'm just simply here to help inform you and help give you some considerations about GLP-1s and help add a little context to that conversation, especially in relation to perimenopause. That's what we talk about here. So what are the trade-offs? So these sound almost too good to be true. And like most things, they usually are. Now, again, there are many circumstances where GLP-1s will save lives, and that is amazing. But it does come with some trade-offs. The biggest impact that I see when it comes to perimenopause and my biggest concern is there is significant muscle and bone loss. There are quite a few studies that are showing substantial lean body mass loss. And lean body mass is your muscle and your bone. And those are two very, very, very critical tissues when it comes to perimenopause and longevity and your long-term health. The other issue that I have with GLP-1s is that there is a rebound weight when you go off of them. People are regaining 50 to 70% of the weight that they've lost. Now, I haven't seen if 50 to 70% of that weight gain is only fat or if it is lean body mass, but my guess is that if the lifestyle pieces are not in place, it is not the lean mass that we are seeing with that increase in that weight gain that's coming back. The other issue that I have is one of the benefits, and that is that it slows down digestion. So it does slow down the emptying of your stomach, which is a big benefit when it comes to slowing glucose release, when it comes to increasing satiety of your meal. There are a lot of benefits to that, but it can also cause 
other types of issues downstream. Whenever we are slowing down our digestion, that can cause other GI effects. So that can cause different overgrowth. I've seen an increase in nausea. I've seen an increase in people reporting reflux issues because the food is staying in their stomach longer and that is causing extra fermentation and their esophageal sphincter to pop open, causing a splash of reflux. So that's just another thing to think about and that people aren't always tying those two together when they are on a GLP-1. It can also cause constipation. And I've talked about this before when it comes to gut health. Anytime we are slowing down our body's digestion, that can cause extra fermentation and overgrowth. That can cause an increase in bloating. That can cause an increase in constipation. That can cause an increase in overgrowths of those more opportunistic inflammatory type bacteria. Now that isn't the case for everyone, of course, but I'm just pointing out some of the things things that I have seen within my practice, but then also anecdotally when I see different feedback from other practitioners I talk with. Another one that isn't talked about as much either is there is a slight increase in showing some mental health risk here of depression or anxiety. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I don't know that there's enough there, but I do want to just mention that in case you are somebody who has a history of that and that is very important for you to understand. And if, lastly, of course, there is the financial cost of it. And that's fine. Like if, if you could afford it, it's not that big of a deal. And honestly, if it is something that changes your health and puts your health in the right trajectory, in the right direction, it could save you not only your life, but it could also save you so much money in the long term because healthcare is not cheap. Hey, if you have found this helpful at all, I would love it if you would hit like, subscribe, or share it with a friend. It helps more women find this type of information during this very confusing life stage. Thank you. So the bottom line is, of course, while there are immense benefits for certain populations of going on GLP-1s, it is not without the trade-offs to consider. And that's what I just really want to point out in this video because I feel that it is not always talked about. So what about the rest of us? If you are not a good fit for a GLP-1 based on a conversation that you had with your doctor or it's not something that you're interested in and you want to try more natural approaches first, you can absolutely support your body's own production of GLP-1 through dietary and lifestyle choices. And there are benefits to this too. You are working with your body's own physiology rather than relying on external drugs. Again, I don't wanna make it seem like I'm bashing them because they can be so important, but they're just simply not a fit for everybody. I just don't want it to come across that it is a good fit for the masses because it simply is not. Plus natural methods of the dietary and lifestyle choices have such a cascade of effects across the body. So it not only helps helps support your metabolic function, but it supports many other systems and functions across the body. And for many, this is a gentler, more sustainable path to go on rather than relying on a drug. And more importantly, there is research that is proving that supporting your body's own natural production of GLP-1 can be just as effective as going on the drug. So let's dive right in to the major nutrition and lifestyle strategies that can boost your body's own production of GLP-1. The first one is to focus on protein and healthy fats first. Of course, fiber does have its place when it comes to blood sugar regulation and helping to blunt the glucose spike into your bloodstream. But research shows that dietary proteins and healthy fats are potent triggers of your body's own production of GLP-1. And there's a lot of reasons of why this matters is because protein helps your satiety. It helps you feel full for longer. It also helps to stabilize your blood sugar. It also helps to support your body's own lean body mass. When we get into that muscle discussion, it helps support your body's muscle. So there's so many benefits to protein aside from supporting your body's own production of GLP-1. Healthy fats help support the signaling of GLP-1, so helping it communicate better within the body. It also helps to slow your digestion as well. So one of the benefits of GLP-1 is it helps to slow your body's digestion to keep you full for longer. Fat does that too. Having a healthy amount of dietary fat within your meals can be a big benefit there as well. Fat's also really important for your body's own production of your sex hormones. So that is a basis of hormone production. So it is important to have a sufficient amount of fat within 
in your diet to be able to support your body's own production of hormones. Even in perimenopause, yes, your hormone production is declining, but that doesn't mean that we just need to forget about it and just let it decline on its own. I don't know about you, but I want to be able to support my body's own production to have a healthy production of those sex hormones for as long as I possibly can. And then of course, fats have a lot of benefits when it comes to other tissue health, including your brain. So it's very important for cognitive health long-term as well. So when we're talking about proteins, I don't want to ruffle some feathers here, but when it comes to the types of protein that are most effective for boosting GLP-1 production, animal proteins are it. They're higher in leucine, which is really important in building and maintaining your muscle. And it has a strong GLP-1 triggering effect. Although plant proteins do contribute to both of these things, they are just simply not quite as effective. And it does take more work to do it well. I'm just explaining what the research is and that it leans a little bit harder in showing that animal-based proteins can be more effective. Now, everyone has their own opinions and you ethically, it may not be a good fit for you and that's okay, you can still support it. It is just more challenging. And I find that when I'm supporting women in this era, we are short on time, we've got a lot of things going on and so a lot of women are wanting the biggest bang for their buck and in that case, that's where I recommend animal-based proteins. And though, of course, protein and fat are big levers when it comes to GLP-1 production and supporting lean muscle mass, promoting satiety from your foods, fiber in fermented foods still play a really important role. So fermentable fibers, those that are like soluble fibers or prebiotic fibers, are broken down by gut bacteria that then produce, as a result, something called short-chain fatty acids. And these can help stimulate the very cells that produce GLP-1. So it's a bit of an indirect way to be able to also support your GLP-1 production. Higher fiber plant foods also help to slow your digestion down and slow the glucose into your bloodstream. So these are supportive of satiety, which means a more gradual glucose release, which then also means that it's a better GLP-1 response. And just overall, a healthy gut by having a variety of plant foods in your diet is very beneficial for gut hormone signaling. So vegetables like asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, artichokes, chokes, leeks, garlic, onions. These are high prebiotic foods that can be very beneficial in feeding your gut. Now, I also want to just mention that those high prebiotic foods can also be really irritating if there are overgrowths in your gut. So don't just go hard on those if you're somebody who suffers with a lot of bloat. Gradually work your way up on those to tolerance. Sometimes cooking them can also help there. Of course, legumes and whole grains are also high in fiber. So things like beans and lentils and oats and barley. And I also love potatoes for this too. They can be high in the resistant starch fiber once they're cooked and then they're cooled. Plus they have so many different minerals and they're a wonderful carbohydrate to have within the diet. And then when it comes to fermented foods, that's things like kefir or kefir, however you want to say it, which is fermented yogurt or plain yogurt. Although plain yogurt doesn't have a lot of bacteria in it unless you make it yourself, but still it is beneficial when it comes to a fermented type food. You've got sauerkraut, kimchi, fermented vegetables, veggies. And then when it comes to structuring your meals, always pairing your carbohydrates with protein and healthy fats is beneficial here. And then the order in which you eat your foods is really important too. So starting your meals with your protein, healthy fats, and fiber rich foods first, and saving your starchy or sugary carbohydrates to last can be very beneficial in supporting a stronger GLP-1 response. And your eating habits matter here too. Grazing all day, snacks here and there, especially if they're not balanced, is not great for blood sugar control, but also not great for your gut. It doesn't help initiate a process called the migrating motor complex called the MMC, which is basically your gut's housekeeping service. This process doesn't start until after 90 minutes after you're done eating. So if you're grazing all day, you're not having this housekeeping service come in and there can be some leftover food in the digestive tract that can continue to ferment and cause bloating and such. And then good mealtime habits. So taking a few deep belly breaths before you start eating your food helps support your body's own production of your digestive juices, which helps to make sure that we are breaking our foods down properly and absorbing those nutrients properly. A third of your stomach acid production is made before the bite of food even hits your mouth. So taking that time before you start eating can be so supportive in your body's own digestive process. And 
to your food. That is one that when we are eating in a rush, we can forget to do it. And it just doesn't seem as important because you can swallow a whole bite of food and it still comes out as poop. And so you think that it's not that important, but it does add a lot of burden onto the digestive tract. There is really important processes that are happening when you chew your food, not only mechanically, but also chemically, and that supports the rest of the digestion of the food lower in the digestive tract. So chewing your food to an applesauce consistency is really important there. It also just helps make you more aware of what you're doing and that you're eating and bringing your brain online to that process so you can be more mindful about how much food you're eating. Next is coming into exercise. So exercise is so much more than the out part of the calories in, calories out equation. It is really important for building and maintaining muscle mass. It also has its cardiovascular benefits, of course, but exercise is very important in helping to ensure that we are utilizing glucose properly and helping to support good blood sugar control. That's why I talk about muscle all the time because it is such a fantastic tissue when it comes to helping support your body's own metabolic processes, which has a cascade of benefits across the body. Strength training is critical, whether you are using drug-induced weight loss, like something like a pharmaceutical GLP-1, or whether you are doing weight loss on your own and even eating in a calorie deficit, we really wanna make sure that we are maintaining our muscle mass as much as we possibly can to support our long-term metabolic health as well as our bone health. And your gut motility matters here too, and movement can support this as well. So doing a gentle walk after eating not only helps with your blood sugar control and it helps your body utilize some of the glucose from your meal so it doesn't cause so much of a spike, but it also helps to get your gut moving in a gentle way that doesn't disrupt digestion. It helps stimulate peristalsis, which is that squeezing muscle of your digestive tract and keeping the food moving along. And the last one is a category that I talk about in almost every single video, kind of like muscle, is sleep. Poor sleep can impair nearly every hormone system in the body, including GLP-1. So high cortisol, disrupted circadian rhythm, inflammation, they can all interrupt your body's own hormone feedback loops. So prioritizing at least seven hours of high quality sleep at night is important in not only managing stress, but also supporting healthy hormone signaling. In fact, it shows that even after one night of poor sleep that your hunger and satiety hormones are completely out of whack. So getting solid sleep is really critical here in addition to the fact that high quality sleep supports that deep repair that is critical to be able to maintain health across the body and if you are on a glp1 the supports that i talk about here can also help you <laughs> they will also be beneficial in getting those diet and lifestyle pieces in place that can set you up for success long term whether or not you decide to continue to stay on a glp1 or not and of course the things that we talked about today are not a substitute for pharmaceutical GLP-1 if that is something that is important to you. Again, this is a conversation for you and your doctor, not for a video on YouTube, but I did think it was really important to talk through GLP-1 and that you do actually produce this on your own and there are many things that you can do to support your body's own production. But there are differences, so typically the doses of GLP-1 are higher than what your body naturally creates, so that's one piece. There's also another piece and that pharmaceutical GLP-1 also has a half-life that is far longer in your body than your body's own production. But that doesn't mean that supporting your body's own natural production of GLP-1 cannot make crazy improvements in your metabolic function and health across your body. The GLP-1 drugs do have major benefits, but they also do require diet and lifestyle changes in order to maintain your health, in order to do it well. My concerns as a practitioner and someone advocating for perimenopausal health is what are the long-term effects of losing 50% of your lean body mass? That's a really big deal. What does that mean for bone health long-term? What does that mean for longevity and metabolic function if you do choose to go off of it? So the natural supports that I talked about in this video are really great ways and sustainable ways to be able to support your body's own production of GLP-1. And in particular, in perimenopause, when your hormones are shifting and your metabolic health is shifting, these levers can help you preserve your muscle mass, improve your metabolic health, and feel more in control. 
control. And if you're looking for more support on how to actually structure your meals when it comes to supporting not only your body's own production of GLP-1, but also supporting hormone health, here's one that I recommend to watch next, which is all about how to eat for healthy hormone balance, which is not only for your body's own sex hormone production, but also hormones like GLP-1. All right, you got this, and I am here with you every step of the way. See you in the next one.